state of emergency, uh, and then we'll open it up to questions. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Today, the government of Saskatchewan has declared a provincial state of emergency, giving the government broad powers to address the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a responsibility that we take incredibly seriously and a decision that we do not take lightly. The declaration of a provincial state of emergency provides our government with powers that include the ability to limit travel to or from a community or a region of the province and directing, or, and directing that a property or equipment can be deployed to address the COVID-19 pandemic that we are facing. The decision to declare this provincial state of emergency comes following confirmation from the Chief Medical Officer that Saskatchewan has eight new presumptive cases of COVID-19, and this decision comes on Dr. Shahab's advice. This brings Saskatchewan's total of presumptive and con confirmed cases of COVID-19 to 16 cases across the province. And Dr. Shahab will have more to say about that in a moment. Additionally, the government in consultation with the Chief Medical Health Officer is imposing a number of, of new restrictions to reduce the risk to Saskatchewan people, to prevent transmission of COVID-19 and to ensure that acute care services are preserved for residents that are most at risk for severe illness. So the following measures are effective immediately. Public gatherings larger than 50 people are prohibited. All restaurants, bars and event venues must limit their seating to 50% of their capacity or up to a maximum of 50 people, whichever is less. All must be able to ensure social distance of one to two meters be between the customers, retail spaces, including Grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations will be exempt from this policy. And I would also note that this is phase one with regards to bars and restaurants, and we may implement phase two in the coming days, which would be closing them completely, except for takeout and delivery options. All gyms, fitness centers, casinos, bingo halls are all ordered to close until further notice. Residents are advised to limit any non-essential travel outside of the province of Saskatchewan with the exception of people who live in border communities and are commuting for work. All Crown Utilities will implement an interest deferral program for up to six months for Saskatchewan residents who, whose ability, who are unable to make bill payments due to the impacts of COVID-19 restrictions. And all government of Saskatchewan ministries, agencies and Crown corporations will implement a a phased-in work-from-home policy that will become effective on Monday, March the 23rd. This is applicable to employees that are deemed non-essential, and this means that any employees that are able to work from home will be able to do so while, provide, while providing managers a period of time to ensure that we have workforce continuity. The Saskatchewan Health Authority will be discontinuing all non-urgent elective surgeries and procedures and diagnostics as of March 23rd. The, this action will allow the Saskatchewan Health Authority to the ability to redeploy nurses and others. You might be endangering the health and the lives of others, your neighbor possibly, or, or even an elderly fa family member. And I know this is completely counterintuitive, especially here in our province. In times of crisis, we are a community and we pull together as one. We've shown that so many times. But today, pulling together means we need to stay apart. It means taking extra precautions like washing your hands more often than you otherwise might or, and practicing social distancing. It means self-isolating for 14 days when you return from international travel. And that is so important. If you are feeling healthy and you haven't been traveling or you haven't been exposed to someone who has tested positive, I would offer you this. You can help by delivering groceries to a friend, to a neighbor, or to a grandparent who may be self-isolating on their own. We need to look after one another. It means buying what we need at grocery stores and not hoarding. And I will repeat precisely what I said the other day. COVID-19 will not cause shortages in our grocery stores, but hoarding will. 
So don't do it. But most importantly, helping each other out during this pandemic, it means listening to Dr. Shahab and his advice that he provides, as well as his counterparts, public health officials from across Canada. And this means, this means each and every one of us should adhere to the advice that they provide us. We are taking action in this province on the very best advice from some of the very best medical professionals in the world, but it simply will not work if we do not follow it, each of us. It's important for us to understand that these measures will not completely prevent the spread of COVID-19, but they will flatten the curve. And it's only together if we take this situation seriously and that's what I'm asking each and every resident of this province is to take this situation very seriously. Responsibility to ourselves, to our family, to our community. We have a personal responsibility to this province and to this nation. In closing, I would, I would just like to thank each and every worker providing, that is providing an essential service in Saskatchewan today. Doctors, nurses, healthcare technicians, paramedics, police officers, and, and firefighters. The work that you do, it's of the utmost importance each and every day, but I think it's even more impactful during this time of tremendous uncertainty. And to the truck drivers and the grocery retailers and the pharmacists and all that are playing a critical part in our supply chain and our communities, thank you for keeping our shelves stocked and, and thank you for keeping our fridges full and our families fed. And to all of the people in this great province of Saskatchewan, I would say this. We will get through this. And we will get through this together. Thank you. We'll take any questions that may be. Why did you wait until after the spending plan was released and this morning's activities went forward before declaring this state of emergency and informing us of this information? The two times aren't connected. Uh, these are separate initiatives, separate conversations that are happening. Uh, this is the time that we do the update uh, with respect to uh, coronavirus, and so this is the time that we're moving forward with on the advice of our of our uh, chief medical health officer. When do you receive that advice? Oh, we've been working on it throughout today, I suppose. Well, uh, yesterday when I was here, I was saying that we should not be surprised to see an increase in cases, primarily due to travel and we should expect to see community transmission. So that was around 3 p.m. when I was here, uh, 2 p.m. And then in the evening, we saw um, eight additional cases. So our cases have doubled in a day, um, but they're all travel-related. So we are seeing ex exactly what we predicted we would see. Um, it's happening pretty fast, but it's still something that is manageable. Um, but at the same time, uh, like the Premier said, we are going to see a lot of people coming back, uh, both short-term visitors and, and long-term travelers coming back. It is essential now that everyone who comes back self-isolates for two weeks because we want to minimize any chance of community transmission. Having said that, we will see community transmission. We will try to control that as well as we can. And that is the purpose of, um, uh, that should be all our, uh, the goal of all of us for the next few weeks to really um, you know, stay at home if you don't have to be out and about. Um, our children are home, um, university students are home. If you have an essential uh, service, you go to work and come home. Uh, we should all go and buy what we need uh, and just that and come home. So I think it is a time to uh, you know, hunker down you know, and just uh, calm everything down for a while. And hopefully that will slow any um, risk of this taking off more quickly than it, it should. What's the risk for community transmission now? Is it, is it remain low or what's it changed to? In the initial sa stages, it is very easy to do case contact follow-up. Now, as more and more people come back, it's harder to stay ahead. And as you know, several flights have been notified uh, in the, in the in, uh, you know, airlines have notified flights where people are traveling back from some destinations, others. So obviously the case contact follow-up is continuing, but we already know that um, uh, in many jurisdictions it is hard to keep up. So that is why it becomes everyone's responsibility. This is not something that someone can police. 
it's all our responsibility to stay home when we come back from travel, to stay home if we're sick. And then it's the responsibility of friends, neighbors, family to uh, not invite you out if you just come back, but to support you, to greet you from a distance, to, do, uh, to help you with your needs, to run errands. And I think that's what we need to do for the next few weeks. Uh, Arthur, next question. Can you talk about how successful you've been in identifying and reaching the contacts of these new cases? Um, how many have you identified? How many do you believe might still be out there? And what are they being asked to do? Are they being asked to self-isolate, to self-monitor? Are they being tested? What is being done with those contacts? So t as of yesterday, it has been successful, but it is going to become challenging. The advice is that when public health contacts an individual who has become ill, that you know, t t uh, track their entire movements during the time that they were symptomatic, and then they determine who was a close contact. So close contacts are uh, uh, requested to self-isolate. People who may not have been close contacts are requested to monitor for two weeks. So as an example of the airline flights, you know, once we get the information of seat rows, we will contact people who were three seats ahead, three seats behind. They are, even they are not considered close contacts, but they are informed to self-isolate. But others in the plane are informed that self-monitor, your risk is lower, but just be aware. But you know, as this time goes on, I think that becomes less and less important because now anyone traveling from some destinations, two weeks ago, that wasn't an issue. You know, uh, three weeks ago, travel from the US wasn't an issue. Two weeks ago, travel from the US became concerning. Last week, we've seen several importations from some destinations that weren't reporting any cases uh, and still not, may not be. So I think now is the time that any travel from outside, you know, self-isolate, and even travel within Canada now, we are hearing from our colleagues across the provinces that community transmission has been established in several provinces. We will see that established. You know, this, like the Premier said, is not something that we can prevent totally, but we have to do everything we can that we break the chains or chain of transmission every opportunity we get. Just a follow-up question. Um, I'm hearing that in one of these cases, I, I, I don't know which one, and I'm not asking you to provide any identifying information, the patient was in a doctor's office for an extended period of time uh, and, and, and ha had been demonstrating symptoms within that doctor's office. Are you aware of that? Can you confirm that's the case? How many contacts may there have been, and what are you doing to contain that? So, uh, and that is an essential point for us to remember at all times, that the ideal situation is that if you've traveled or otherwise you have a fever cough, you call Healthline, and if you have to see your primary care provider, you call ahead. If you have to uh, call EMS or go to an ER, you call ahead, so that people, the staff are ready to receive you, put you in your side room. Don't show up without calling ahead. If you do show up, you know, the staff will, try, will put, offer you a mask, put you in a side room. We want to minimize the situation where someone is coughing and waits in a waiting room. But that has happened in a few instances. That results in a larger number of people uh, being told to self-isolate, including healthcare providers. And, and it is um, a, a significant impact for healthcare providers who weren't expecting you. So, you know, healthcare providers aren't wearing a mask all the time. But if you have a cough and fever and you call ahead, then they'll put on the proper PP. So, yes, that is uh, uh, happening. And that is why it's important that every person be aware of what their responsibilities are before going to seek, seeking, seek care. And just two super quick clarifying questions. Uh, one, you, you said earlier that, that, that all of the cases have been connected to travel, but it says in the press release that one, you have not uh, demonstrated a definitive contact to travel. So, Can you confirm that? Yeah. And secondly, um, um, are these patients, sorry, are these contacts being tested? So. All the cases have been linked to travel or a household contact of travel, and that's uh, in most cases it's travel to um, um, it's travel to uh, places outside of Canada. But in two instances, it's travel to a large conference. Uh, secondly, I think that's a really important point. If you are a close household contact, uh, we have to remember that um, uh, 15 out of the 16 cases are doing fine in the home setting. Other people in the household can safely stay at home. Most people, if they follow basic precautions, don't get sick from exposure, even in the home setting. Um, but if you are a household contact, you also have to stay home for two weeks. Once your two, two weeks are over, you are cleared. And many cases also, within you know a day or two, 
if, uh, within about 10 days of symptom onset, um, clear the virus and are free. So people are going to be clearing this for the most part within two weeks of becoming sick, and their household members will also be clear. So in a week or two, we'll already see people emerging on the other end and their contacts emerging on the other end. Contacts, as long as they remain well, and the vast majority do remain well, need to self-isolate, don't need testing. But if they develop fever, cough, they should be tested. But because they're staying home, they hopefully will not have no further contacts. So I think that's why we need to break the chains of transmission, and this is the way to do it. Jeff, yeah, I've been told that um, a patient in Saskatoon who had been undergoing surgery tested positive, and that now his surgery or his or her surgical team uh, has been um, put on isolation. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can tell me anything about that. So I don't have that information, and um, we usually uh, don't get information where someone has symptoms. They, if there's a concern that, if, because many people may develop symptoms and then they are tested, and once the test is reported, then public health confirms the test, the clinician confirms the test. So I have not heard of this instance. So my story was that, that it was a person who had you know, subsequently tested positive. So I would assume that it would be one, A, that you'd know about it, B, you would have done some trace, contact tracing on. So, so I have not heard of this particular instance, but you know, obviously if this is the case, we will hear shortly. Just a follow -up. So can you tell me, um, so I've been following the news in other jurisdictions where they've uh, been able to um, talk about, so here's the number of beds. Here's the number of uh, critical care beds that we have available. Here's, so I'm looking for, can you can you tell me what the range is of a uh, possible, like how like, realistically, how prepared are we if this thing ends up being what it's predicted to be, say 20%, 30% of the province infected and the death rate is as we've seen it. Yeah. So, can you, yeah. I get it's it's yeah. a little bit speculative. Yeah. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Other jurisdictions have been providing this information. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be important for Saskatchewan. So, so you know that's a really important point, and you're absolutely right that over a course uh, the course of 12 to 18 months, 30 to 70 percent of us will get COVID-19. But that's exactly the point of all these social distancing measures, because if all of us get exposed within one to three months, as happened in Wuhan, because they didn't know the virus. You know, it started in end of November in Wuhan. They only caught on to it in being a novel virus end of December. So by that time, you know, it was established community transmission. They couldn't get ahead of the curve. Um, and a similar thing happened in northern Italy, where you know, community transmission, it didn't happen by identifying a traveler. It happened by rapid uh, take of community transmission in a population in northern Italy, uh, Italy that was primarily elderly. That is exactly what we want to avoid. And what that does is that if all of us get exposed over you know, 12 to 18 months, if, you know, 80% will get a mild illness. 20% will require some level of hospital care, maybe a week, maybe longer, oxygen uh, and supportive care, or if antivirals are available, th th those can be given. If vaccine is available by 8 to 12 months, that will be given to further reduce, flatten the curve. And about 2% will require ICU care, 2 to 5% of uh, the, uh, you know all people who get exposed. But as long as all those pressures come slowly over you know, eight to 12 months, the health system still needs to expand its surge capacity, maybe by 50%, but it can manage. If we don't do social distancing, no health system in the world can manage. And I think that's a critical point. And this is not up to the health system to manage. They can manage as long as the rest of us can flatten the curve. If the rest of us can't flatten the curve, no health system in the world can manage. Next question, Britain. Oh, yeah, I'm just wondering, when was the last time, if ever, the province has declared a state of emergency? I'm not aware of a provincial state of, the, of emergency. There has been community states of emergency during times of flood or forest fire, things of that nature, multiple community emergencies. I'm not aware off the top of my head when the last time the province have proper has declared a state of emergency, and I, I would hope that that 
uh, lends itself to the importance of what Dr. Shahab has been talking about with respect to how our health system will be able to manage um, what is coming at Saskatchewan. Um, the, the only way we manage that is by flattening the curve. There is no health system in the world that can manage uh, this virus if we are not able to practice uh, personal distancing, social distancing, if we're not able to flatten the curve in, in some way. Uh, next question, Karen. Um, when you talk about uh, capacity, I'm wondering about uh, facilities we might use. Like, could we see um, old schools, um, things like that, pressed into service for facilities? <coughs> so, uh, those assessments that were done in 2009 and never required. So in 2009, all those assessments were done. Now they are being revised and almost finalized, especially with COVID-19. And that's exactly the point that if required, how do you bring online more acute care beds? How do you bring online more alternate levels of care for people who just need support that they can't get at home? For example, if there's two people in the house, both are ill and require some level of support, can they be cohorted? in a place that's not a hospital, but it's a, it could be a school or something. And those were all plans that were made in 2009, were made even before that. They were ne not needed in 2009, and that was really good. We hope we don't need them this time around, but those plans are being refreshed. And to the Premier, I'm just wondering if we could get a reaction to this morning's announcement from the Prime Minister. The uh, right. A uh, very, very positive announcement uh, from our federal government. Literally billions of dollars uh, invested and invested, I would say, uh, in a very, very effective and positive manner. Um, a large amount of money that is going to be made available to individuals very quickly, and it's going to be made available to individuals that I would put forward um, require it. Um, they've uh, shortened or eliminated the wait time for employment insurance. Uh, they have addressed uh, those that don't qualify for employment insurance, so single, single uh, person uh, businesses that are operating, accountants, uh, plumbers, uh, electricians, things of that nature. Uh, they have uh, provided funding for those uh, that are uh, remaining at home from work to take care of a family member that is ill. They have provided funding for uh, parents that need to remain at home and take care of their children. They've provided funding. Uh, for businesses uh, to invest uh, in retaining uh, their employees. Uh, this is uh, what I think is, uh, you, you know, many may talk about the, the size of the package. I would say that it's a, an appropriate size for this, at, for this point of time. Um, we can continue to talk to see how long this goes on to, but I would say it's an appropriate size for today. And it is very, very t uh, well targeted uh, to those that, that require it. We are now actively looking if there are opportunities for the province to uh, dovetail into that in any way as uh, to, uh, you know, provide further supports if necessary. Like, would that include something like federal, provincial student loans? We're, yeah, we're... Well, we're, we're, we, what we've done here today is uh, with our utility bills are provided an interest-free uh, area. We know there are some people that, um, you know, may have some challenges paying some of their utility bills over the next number of months, and, and we don't want them to be saddled with uh, any interest costs on that. They also won't be disconnected over the course of the, ne the next six months as well. So uh, that's a start, um, but we are looking at what came forward here today uh, in, the, uh, in the federal package, which I would put forward was an effective package. Uh, two questions, one of which is, uh, I know it's impossible to do, but can you give a, a rough time frame as to how long the state of emergency is expected to last? And secondly, uh, I'm getting communication basically saying the message is not getting out. So if we're in the middle of this state of emergency, what can government do more to get the message? I just got a text from Sarah, from someone basically saying that the Polytech Institute, they, they're still requiring doctor's notes to stay home. You're hearing all kinds of stories like that. At, you know, my own school, I know, I still need notes to get my kid uh, excuse from classes. Right. Well, we're, we're, we're doing our best with respect to this, uh, holding uh, news conferences virtually daily, um, other provinces as well, and, and the federal government also holding news conferences daily. We have uh, the very best medical advice uh, also holding news conferences virtually daily in Saskatchewan and across uh, the country. Um, our MLAs are going back to their constituencies in many cases, uh, not Cabinet. Cabinet is remaining behind to operate uh, solely focused essentially on COVID-19. 
but uh, our, our MLAs are going back to their constituencies now to, and they are picking up the phone and talking to people about the seriousness of this situation. And, and, and let, me, let me just say this and reiterate what Dr. Shahab had said a few minutes ago. Uh, if we are not able to flatten the curve, if we don't take these social distancing uh, measures seriously, there is no health system in the world that will be able to manage what will occur. It is incumbent on us in this province uh, to do our level best to ensure that we are able to flatten that curve and that our health system is able to handle what is going to happen over the course of the next weeks, next number of weeks, and the next number of months. Question on the time frame, please. Sure, sure. Um, uh, <laughs> it is an impossible question, uh, but the, the order is put forward. It's, it has a 14-day lifespan, and at that point in time, if it needs to be renewed, it will be. Um, Two-pronged question for, for Dr. Shahab. Um, when you talk about community transmission, um, why the 50-person gathering limit? I mean, shouldn't it perhaps be smaller than that? Also, um, why can you clarify why you don't consider a household contact in um, to be community transmission? Yeah. Sorry, and three prong question um, for close contacts. Who, who for contacts of people who've tested positive and are being contacted now? Do they need to get tested, and why not? So, so, so was the last one again? Sorry. The people who have come in contact with those who have symptoms yeah, yeah. or um, or have tested positive, okay. do they need to be tested? Okay, so I'll try to answer them, but I'll answer the first one first and then move back. But if I forget, then it's a five-pronged question, I think. <laughs> but so if you're a close household contact and you keep your distance in the house, there's a good chance you won't get infected. So there's no reason to test. Because if you're asymptomatic, the test is negative. And if you're fine after 14 days, and the person who is your household member who had mild symptoms, they are fine, everyone's clear. So public health will give you the all clear. There's no reason to test. If you do get symptomatic, it could be COVID, it could be something else. So you are tested. If it's something else, you're still fine. You complete your 14 days. If it's COVID, you then continue for another eight, nine days till you've cleared. And then everyone is fine. So that's the best case outcome. So that is my the last question. What is the your? Um, the do people, I guess anyone, many people might be uh, very concerned if they hear of anybody they've been in contact with symptoms who may have been linked to travel. Do yeah, they need, uh, can uh, about they get the fifty tested? people. I think I'll link it to the fifty. But fifty is not, and uh, there's nothing magical in fifty. Uh, last time, you know, initially many jurisdictions uh, in North America, Europe are using two fifty. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Um, if I go into a meeting room and people aren't sitting one meter apart, I refuse to attend that meeting. And I actually will hold that meeting and ask everyone to move a uh, meter apart. And if there's enough, not enough room in that meeting room, everyone else can go to another room and we can dial in. Um, if I'm invited to someone's house, um, you know, I'll say, how many people uh, can we sit two meters apart? I'm not very popular right now, but I won't go if we can't sit two meters apart. And I don't want to go to a gathering with more than four or five people, actually. That's my comfort level right now. 50 is like a speed limit. Just because it do, it do, it is 50 doesn't mean that everyone needs to invite 49 people to their house. I think you need to minimize contact as much as humanly possible. 50 seems to be the right number right now, because or up to 50% of your capacity. If there's a restaurant that can seat 30 people, they should actually have 15, because when you, in a restaurant, usually you're sitting pretty close apart. But if you keep every second seat empty and across the table, you usually have a one or two meter separation. So those are general guidelines. But I think that's how all of us should think. And then if you are um, elderly, have underlying risk factors, you need to be especially cautious of where you're going and not going. And as a visitor, you need to be very careful about visiting and keep that social distancing even when visiting. And what about funerals? Yeah, I mean, I think personally, uh, I know I've heard reports where people are doing virtual funerals where they, really the immediate family member goes and the others can um, participate, you know, virtually. It sounds a bit strange. I think, you know, funerals, like the Premier said, weddings, those are all occasions to be together. Weddings can be delayed. Funerals can't necessarily in every situation. But this is not the time to have close gatherings, whether it's, you know, prayers, funerals, uh, celebrations. Celebrations we we can delay, 
um, um, uh, funerals. We should absolutely support our friends and family who are going through hard times, but support in a way that keeps them safe and keeps everyone else safe. Um, I know this is early days and you probably don't have a huge grasp on um, everything, but I think a lot of people are already kind of going stir crazy and wondering how long this can last and restaurants having closed voluntarily, um, just jumping straight into closure without doing like the distancing of tables and stuff. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned eight to 12 months for vaccines and things like that. Can we expect to be locked up in our houses for eight months or? So uh, what we have seen from um, uh, countries in Southeast Asia that did everything right is that eight weeks, 12 weeks out, they have seen it come in a flat way and then cautiously they can relax on some things but not other things, cautiously. So they may not open schools right away, they may not uh, allow large events, but they can ease up on some of that, you know, like restaurants and those kind of things. So I think, but we are only into um, uh, uh, the, the like 10th week of this outbreak. And we're, you know, we're in the middle of March. It's only been going around for two and a half months in terms of an So we are looking back at people who did the right thing, um, and, you know, two months back, and now they're at the other end, and they still have to sustain, but they can start, you know, some things can start normalizing. Um, but I think right now we need to sustain the next eight weeks at least, um, and then reevaluate. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions related to, uh, to dentistry uh, from a colleague in Saskatoon. Um, so will you uh, be uh, banning elective dental procedures? Hello again, Peter Van Dusen. We're going to jump in on the uh, Saskatchewan COVID-19 update. That province now declaring a state of emergency, which will allow it <coughs> greater powers to deal with uh, with what's happening in that province. Uh, eight new cases there for a total of 16 as they deal with uh, the movement of that uh, virus through that province. Uh, this is our continuing special coverage, of course. And I think that it's really important because um, till such time you could safely self-isolate if you had traveled from abroad or if you were at a conference, there, there was a conference where, you know, not just dentists, but people who work in the dental profession had been in Vancouver, and there's at least two, if not three people. One is a house who called two people who have been impacted by that. So at the moment, if you were exposed, you obviously need to not uh, go to work as a healthcare provider, whether it's dentist, physician, other provider. Um, there is a good reason that as this starts transmitting locally, you have to think about what's the risk to you, what's the risk to your patient, what's the risk to your uh, you know, people sitting in the waiting room based on what services you provide. So dentistry, you know, we, th we say that this is a virus that's transmitted to contact through nose, uh, uh, you know, uh, no nose, eyes, and mouth. But dentistry is all about being inside someone's mouth. So obviously dentists are professionals. They have very high standards of infection control and the highest of all professionals. So they are actively looking at how can they continue to safely provide urgent care? How can they space out their patients they need to have the same controls ERs and physician offices have that they shouldn't, someone shouldn't come even for a root canal if they're coughing, you know, they need to have some pain relief till they, at least the fever is settled for a few days, but then they can provide emergent care with precautions. So urgent care obviously will need to be provided, but routine care should probably be, as this community transmission picks up, they should probably start scaling back as much as they can. Why is it probably, why aren't you, um, I mean, you could do probably, should well, I think I've had certainly this discussion with the registrar of the College of Dentists, and so this information has got out, gone out. We're willing to work with them to see, you know, I think for, I don't, I don't think it's a problem to write orders for everything and everyone. I think as professionals, all of us can do a risk assessment for what's safe for us and our patients, and I think that's the spirit in which dentists, other people who provide personal care, not just in health, but other services, have to make that risk assessment. We have time for a few more questions. I've got Mark, Arthur, and Steph. Is, there's been some confusion with the self-assessment tool, uh, people being told through it to go to ERs. Uh, what should people be doing um, if they have symptoms and want to get tested? And is there any plans to open more assessment sites? 
So our tests have gone up significantly. I don't have the numbers, but they have gone up from 1,000 something to 1,800, 1,900. So tests are ramping up. They're happening all over the province. Um, our cases also are all over the province, north, rural, south, Regina, Saskatoon. Um, I'll have to check. I, I, I've used it a few times, but it seems to work as designed right now. Obviously, we may need to tweak it a bit if we see a lot of tuning transmission because at some point, and, and some provinces have already gone there, BC has already gone there, it, it's not effective if you have a lot of community transmission to test because you already know it's here. Then for mild illness, you stay put, you stay at home, you get over it, and that's it. We're not at that point yet. We do want to test. Uh, but then at some point, you have to say, okay, we'll test people who are still coming back after travel, but we know that's going to dry up very quickly in a week or two. And we want to focus on testing people who are seriously ill, and who work in essential services, healthcare workers, they can't self-isolate every time they encounter with the case because they'll, you know, they. Have, but as long as they're using proper precautions, they don't have to self-isolate because they're not considered exposed. But if there's an issue, if they have a cough, a fever, they can stay at home. They can get tested. If it's cleared and the fever settles, they can go back to work. If it's COVID-19. They have to stay home for eight, nine days, maybe not the full 14 days because we're learning more and more. And then they can be cleared, tested again, and go back to work a bit early if it, they've cleared the virus. So that's the approach we'll have to take going forward. But we will have to adjust our approach. Uh, two, uh, uh, two uh, sorry. First question for the Premier. Um, I wanted to ask you about the powers that are made available to you under the state of emergency, and particularly the power to limit travel to or from a community or region. Um, under what circumstances would you make use of that power? I, and particularly now, given that there is evidence that there may be community transition, are you considering any particular regions or communities? And what would that mean if you did make use of it for people's day-to-day -day lives? So there's a number of, of things that uh, one would use uh, this, this, uh, this act and this power for. And let me be clear, it was my sincere hope that we don't use it and don't use it once. Um, but you could use it, ex for example, uh, to set the price of certain items. You could use it, uh, for example, to set the volumes of, of purchases that could be available for certain items to an individual. Or you could use it to, uh, to isolate a portion of a building, uh, a, a, building uh, a community, uh, or a, an entire town, village, or, or city. Um, anywhere in the province. And so uh, now as we are looking like we have a number of new cases and the potential for possible community transmission, of which I think we will get to at some point if this particular uh, case is not that, um, we, we're not going to eliminate um, COVID-19 from being exposed to the people of the province. What we want to do is slow down uh, the the rate at which it is exposed, uh, which people of Saskatchewan are exposed to, or flatten the curve, if you will. Um, so that that's precisely how we would be viewed as uh, is using this. Is if we need to move in and move in very quickly uh, to do something just like that to to isolate a, a portion of a community or an entire community. So we're we're not we don't have anywhere in mind where we would use it immediately, but we think it needs to be available uh, to act uh, very quickly in what is an increasingly a volatile situation. And, uh, I'm not sure who would take this question, but I I'm hearing very specific reports uh, about swab shortages. Uh, for instance, in the Five Hill, the, the former Five Hills Health Region, uh, in Assiniboia, potentially in you know other areas. Can you confirm whether or not that's the case? Give us an update on on how many swabs are available and whether they're sufficient to meet the expected demand and and further explain whether that's had any impact whatsoever on the guidelines being used to determine when testing is done. I, I'll, I'll answer at a very high level and then I'll ask uh, either of you if you'd like to uh, go into any specifics that you might have information on and I don't have information on, on the specifics but with respect to um, supplies, um, whether it's testing supplies or personal protective equipment uh, supplies. Uh, we were on a call again this morning with the Premiers and the Prime Minister uh, discussing just this. Uh, we are actively have orders in for a number of uh, not only swabs and different types of swabs but also uh, a number of different types of personal pr protective equipment as well. And we're working actively with other provinces and the federal government to, to, uh, to 
ensure we can we can find that supply. We're also uh, hunting out and about on our own as well uh, to looking uh, for additional supply as well as these are items that the rest of the world is looking for at this at this very same time. So I'm I'm not aware of any shortages at the moment uh, with respect to uh, any of the items that we need. Um, and I'm not aware that it has in any way impacted the number of tests that we're doing in the case of swabs. In fact, uh, Dr. Shahab had just referenced uh, we did more tests in the last 24 hours than we have at any point in time uh, thus far, and, and it's our expectation that will that will continue uh, to increase. So, in saying that, we continue to to look for not only for supply of the swabs we have, but but additional kinds as well. So, either of you have uh, anything to add to that? I'll just make a comment and then let Dr. Shahab. I was at a ministry briefing yesterday uh, where we discussed uh, supplies and uh, specific to swabs. I was told at that time, I forget exactly how many days, but we had like a number of days left of the supply that they had been using. They're expecting another significant supply in by the end of the week. And uh, in the uh, in the eventuality that for some reason, although they're, they fully expect, expect that uh, that order to arrive, if it doesn't, uh, they have a significant number of, of a different type of swab. Um, as, as they described it to me, it, it's not, uh, it, it can absolutely be used. The lab prefers the other type somehow for ease of use, but um, I, I took uh, great comfort out of that briefing. Yeah, I think I haven't heard about this particular instance, but as testing ramps up, there's a bit of supply pressures that then you have to redistribute. So far, we're doing okay, but at some point, we do need to revisit how, how how we test and maybe in in the future sometime we would not recommend testing for mild illness because we're already learning now that um, and in fact there was a scientific paper uh, I read yesterday that we discussed uh, at our FPT table where uh, the good news is that the majority of people more than 80 percent have a mild self-limited illness and they cleared the virus in eight to nine days they're actually free of the virus on day 10 we still require them to isolate for two weeks but actually by day, day 10, they're clear of the virus. So that's the good news. So previously, everyone had to be tested negative at the end. Now that is actually not the recommendation of a mild illness. So, you know, we're trying to rationalize the testing as much as we can as well. Last question, Steph. Um, you mentioned that community transmission is suspected or is happening when an infected person from traveling goes home and obviously spends time with their loved ones. Is, are you considering uh, some kind of an order or option where people who are self-isolating have to go somewhere completely alone? They're not allowed to, say, go back home to be with their family or, or roommates or whatever it may be? And if that option's on the table, like, how would that actually work? Yeah. So, first of all, uh, we don't have any evidence of community transmission at this point, but we expect it to happen. Uh, in the instances in Saskatchewan and in many parts of Canada, the way uh, you know people uh, who are symptomatic self-isolate at home, uh, clear instruction is given to them, and there's been very few cases of secondary transmission in the whole household setting. We have just seen one instance, and that may have been a common exposure while traveling to another province, but we have not seen any in, uh, evidence of secondary household transmission. It means that people are able to self-isolate even within the household. Um, by community transmission, we mean that uh, someone shows up in ER and they have not traveled anywhere, they were not in contact with the person who was sick, or you get an outbreak in a long-term care facility where no one visited the long-term care facility who was sick and had just traveled uh, from abroad. So then you can't find where it came from. So that's when we say it's community transmission. We try, still try to search for the source, but if we can't find anything in a few days, we say community transmission is here. It may only be in a part of the province, but all the steps we've taken is exactly to delay those eventualities. Don't visit long-term care if you've come from another province, unless for compassion reasons, and then just go and visit the person you have to. You know, don't visit hospitals. Absolutely don't visit uh, people who are vulnerable in home or a facility, if, even if you have a cough and you think you're fine, it's just a cough. Those are essential precautions now uh, for going forwards. Going through the uh, Sask alerts, it seems a little bit better than Twitter feeds or Facebook or anything else for mass communication. Oh, for like we do, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's not that's an, that's an option. We haven't uh, we haven't done it as of yet. Uh, that is an option though, because there are some, uh, you know, in the uh, in the vein of of taking uh, this very seriously. Uh, you know, we must remember that it, it quite likely isn't 
is someone of my age, and uh, not that I'm overly healthy, but I, I feel pretty good. Um, I'm likely going to have mild symptoms as the as the data shows. Um, but my my parents are at a, a higher risk category, and so the danger is not directly to me; it's to my parents and their generation, and it's to. Uh, uh, those individuals in in uh, you know our retirement communities and in our long-term care facilities uh, and, and where we are seeing uh, terrible results, fatal results in Canada are in our long-term care facilities. And we need to be very, very diligent, not only in our personal distancing, but I would ask the people of this province to be very diligent in whether or not they need to visit a long-term care facility or visit uh, anyone in our community that would be considered at a, uh, a decreased immunity or uh, consider vulnerable to this virus. This is where we need to keep it out of. Thanks very much. Everyone. That's all Can our I just we have ask today. if we're going to continue these given social distancing? <laughs> Yeah. I, can, I can address that after. Okay. Uh, we're just going to uh, take a minute to reset, and then we'll have the Premier back out here. Cool. Let us refill your water.